Our first speaker is Dr. Carla Lamb, the Director of Interventional Pulmonary Medicine at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center. She's also steering committee for Rescue Lung. So we're excited to have her kick off the presentations today. Then we have Dr. George Chang, the Director of Interventional Pulmonology, Bronchoscopy and Pleural Disease at UC San Diego. He is also the Director of Interventional Pulmonology Fellowship there. So we're very excited to have Dr. Chang with us tonight. And then we also have Dr. Kyle Hogarth, the Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago, who's the Director of uh, Bronchoscopy and Interventional Pulmonary, the Co-Director of the Lung Cancer Screening Program and the Director of the Lung Nodule Program. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Lamb to kick us off. Um, well, thanks so much, Nicole, and thanks for the, to the audience for coming and joining the webinar and for the team that put this together. Um, I'm going to cover this uh, in a fairly rapid fire uh, session. Uh, I apologize if you're hearing uh, snow plows in the background. <laughs> I do live in Boston. So, um, but I think this is a very important topic, and I, I want to kind of give an overview of some of the lessons learned pearls and pitfalls of our, our lung screening program, as well as our lung nodule program. And here are some of the things I'll highlight along with the other speakers, is talk a little bit about, about the evolution of our own lung cancer screening program and the eligibility criteria that's uh, grown over the last two years, and then understand the evaluation of the lung nodule, specifically the incidental lung nodule, which I would define as one of the most vulnerable populations. And then how do we integrate these risk stratifying technologies such as biodesics in the indeterminate nodule to help us either get to a biopsy um, recommendation sooner for diagnosis and then when to do surveillance and be comfortable and allay patient anxiety relative to that by giving them an additional piece of information that helps us all feel more comfortable with following the patients interly. Next slide, please. So I have some disclosures um, that I'm identifying here. I've served in different roles through different uh, industry um, groups. Next slide. So this, I think a picture is always worth a thousand words, right? So if you can imagine, if we truly are screening all the eligible patients for lung cancer, the low dose CT scanning, we would have far, far less incidental lung nodules coming through the ER. And I think that's probably one of the big take home points. If we're really screening, uh, appropriately, and you'll see some of the statistics that shows we have a lot of work to do. We've been screening at Leahy for the last uh, really 11 years. We had one of the largest, um, outside of the NLST, one of the largest lung screening programs in the country. And we've had some, we've learned a lot of good lessons, which I'll share with you. But I think there's nothing else more impactful at any kind of screening that we do from head to toe than that of lung screening uh, with CT scan the appropriate patient. Next slide. So I think this is just important to make sure we're all on the same page. You know, the, the change in the criteria is significant. March 2021, the USPSTF recognized uh, a younger age population. But let me be clear, the NCCN from day one recommended screening, and they called it group two back in 2011, 2012. And it was the younger patient, age 50. We, found, we actually screened in our Leahy program from the very beginning the classically known group one NLST and the group two NCCN that recognized the younger patient with a lesser tobacco history. And even early on, we found the same incidence of lung cancer in that younger population with a lesser PAC year. Um, just to even clarify, the, the, there's actually three criteria for third party payers in Medicare, which they've agreed to consider eligible for lung screening, and that's age 50 to 80, 20 PAC year tobacco history, and quit less than 15 years. But let me tell you that we're, our, we've always been pushing back on that third criteria. Uh, those of us who've been doing lung screening for a long time, not to mention the ILCAP international database, clearly shows that patients are still at risk for lung cancer well beyond their quit of 15 years and beyond. So we just have to know that there, we're still probably not screening all the population that we should be screening, but we, we need to at least get what we were approved for uh, right in these patients. That almost doubles the number of patients who are eligible. Next slide. This is just a little timeline of our own personal uh, evolution of our lung screening. We know that New England Journal article came out in 2011, showed that it had a mortality and a, mor a mortality impact by screening. 
Um, and then evolutions of what was considered a positive happen. We actually offered um, discounted rate CT scans. We, we did it for 350, only four patients came. We pushed the uh, administration to offer them for free for the first two years of our screening program and everyone showed, more patients showed up. It made a difference when you offered it for free. It broke down all barriers. And, and to date, uh, actually I can update this slide even further. As of March, um, I'm getting a message that people are not seeing the slides. Um, Hmm. on the chat. Earlier it had been in presentation mode and now it stopped being in presentation mode. A bunch of people are saying they're seeing slides. Okay, some do, some don't, okay. I am sharing my screen. So I'm wondering if there's a delay, I can- I think the majority of people are responding, they can see. Um, only one person said they could not see. So I guess we'll keep, keep rolling along. Um, so as of actually March of this year, 2023, we've actually screened over 9,500 patients in our program. We've detected 346 lung cancers, so an incidence of about 3.3%. Next slide. This is just a more granular. We have a weekly executive summary where we track patients both with, within Leahy and outside of Leahy who participate in our own in our lung screening program. We have on any given week, we have a rolling average currently, but we're screening about anywhere from 4, 30 to 50, sometimes 30 to 60 patients per week, and that varies. But that's just kind of a, a little a, one of the snapshots of how we track patients, among other things. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the fundamental elements that I would argue are important, not only, only for lung screening, but also for a successful uh, incidental lung nodule program outside of lung screening. And I'll just kind of highlight the, the key elements that we were foundational for us. You can see you need to have people from all the major discipline stakeholders from lung nodules, and you can never walk away from the effort. You know, someone has to always be minding the store, so to speak. And we always have to keep track of our volume, our patients to make sure they don't get lost to follow up. Standardized reporting, that's lung RADS for us. But now we're using AI, natural language processing software and radiology, and also on the clinical side, finding ways to communicate with the EMR so the patient, a human being can coordinate and track the patients and shepherd them through each of their steps when they need additional workup, in addition to evaluation by follow-up CT scan. Keeping in mind, the majority of patients who are lung screened don't have cancer. They have really no significant actionable finding. Only, only about three or four percent of those patients will have a finding that qualifies them for further evaluation beyond recommended radiology interval follow-up. Next slide. So this is just to highlight from the very beginning, we gave away information about our program constructs from the very beginning. So every there's a, at least one program in every state in the country who has utilized our Leahy um, program for upstarting, if you will, their programs. And I think that's important. It just shows that there's an investment um, by us and many uh, to do the right thing for patients. Next slide. I think this is the reality check. This was published in 2020. This is the state, state nationwide statistics of the percentage in each state of patients um, who are actually being screened. Massachusetts is still one of the highest and that's only 15 to 16%. So it just tells you, even in states that are considered high um, accruement per screening, still are far, far below what we want to be as a collective group. And so I think we just have to take pause and recognize we have significant work to do. And you want to really uh, harness your primary care because they are the ultimate champions to enhance compliance for patients to agree and participate in lung screening. That's what we found was our, our special sauce was to engage the primary care frequently, uh, certainly often, and engage them and make it a streamlined process for them. The other thing I'll mention here is that don't forget the, uh, the patients who get mammography. We've also identified, among others, women who are getting regular mammographies often qualify equally well for lung screening, and they're not being captured. They're not being screened. So we've actually, po we post 24 seven in every mammography waiting room in our organization, the, the screening criteria for lungs, lung cancer and give them contact information so they can be patient facing and empowered to, to reach out for screening. 
And that we've already seen an uptick in screening just by empowering patients with the information they qualify. Next slide. Next slide, please. This is just an FYI. Um, lung RADS as of November of 2022, they updated more granular criteria. I think you'd, you really need to spend some time with it. More importantly, your radiologist, we, you want them to spend a lot of time with this. The standardization of reporting is also the special sauce for success in getting patients uh, to the right recommendations and making it easier for the ordering provider to understand and follow suit with that. So I just want you guys to know you can go to the ACR website and find that updated information. Next slide. I also want to dispel an over-reported and often incorrectly reported false positive rates. And I just want to highlight this, and we found this to be true in our own program. If you may, if you look here very carefully, remember a New England Journal at the NLST, the, the positive test was a four millimeter nodule. And, the, and then now that's shifted to an eight millimeter nodule or a new six millimeter nodule. So when you take a patient and you keep them into the same screening program consecutively over the first scan, the second the scan, and the third scan, look how dramatically the, the quote unquote false positive finding drops. So I think we, we should really allay pay providers and patients that the false positive rate is significantly lower than what was originally quoted in the NLST. So we have to break that barrier because sometimes our, our own providers are sabotaging patient conversations because of that. Next slide. This is actually Leahy data we published. And this actually looked at um, based on, we actually have submitted a new recommendation for reporting of um, radiology results. And what we found that was, I think, most interesting is that of all the potentially benign findings, now a new six millimeter nodule is considered now a lung rads four, but of all the findings you find on CT scan, the six millimeter nodule had a significant predictability in the first year of becoming cancer. And so historically in our own program, outside of lung screening, the incidental lung nodule threshold by which we get them into the nodule clinic is six millimeters. So our threshold's a little different than others based on our own internal data. Next slide. These are just some resources. I think you guys are gonna have these uh, slides recorded and you'll have access to them later. I wanna highlight, this is actually, we founded this organization here at Leahy called Rescue Lung Society. It's a website that has patient facing and, and, so, and provider facing information about lung screening. We'll have a future conference coming up in September in Boston. That's all things lung cancer screening. And they, here are some other resources that I think are, are very valuable patient facing and we'll give you kind of a, a, a kind of a collection of resources so that you can navigate all the information as it changes. Next slide. So again, perspective as we, as we kind of roll more into the incidental lung nodule, um, I think we have to appreciate there's a lot of lung nodules out there. Again, I just charge you with, if we screen appropriately, we'll have a lot less incidentals, we'll have more directional based on proper stratification. And if you look here, back before the USPCF USPSTF changed the guidelines and increased the, vo the volume of patients who were screen eligible, even in 2019 with a lesser uh, criteria or let a, a different criteria, only 5.7% in all comers nationwide were being screened. Next slide. So I'm going to quickly, this is busy, but I'll quickly go through. This is where our workflow in our lung clinic merges together. Lung res fours, and sometimes lung rads threes will get a pulmonary consult for very further evaluation. And also the incidental lung nodule, we have a, a systematic way of using a nuanced software to identify the denominator of lung nodules and all of our CT imaging in our, in our organization. That list gets curated by a human being. Uh, it gets tiered by less than six millimeter, greater than six millimeter nodule. And then a clinical navigator picks that up, takes a deep dive in the chart. We have, I'll show you in a moment some inclusion criteria for the incidental nodule. And those patients, we pinned an order in EPIC to the primary care for a lung nodule consult uh, visit and a CAT scan if appropriate. And that also empowers us to tell the patient that their primary care has been communicated with and they are on board with the effort. And that has markedly enhanced our compliance rates for 
for patients coming for the first time to a lung nodule clinic in, in, in a process and patient and people who they've never met. And I call it the lung um, pulmonary car wash. So once we get them in there, we screen them to make sure they've, if they've never had a PFT, they get a PFT, smoking cessation, pulmonary rehab when appropriate, uh, immunization. And then we begin to stratify their nodule especially if they're outside of lung screening to see where can we use a biomarker or some other minimally invasive or non-invasive way to further stratify them to either follow them carefully with CAT scan versus move on with a biopsy. Next slide. This is just a more granular workflow about what our clinical navigator does within our system. Um, and we have no, plenty of non lahey patients who come through our ED. Our ER physicians have been charged with communicating to the patient if they have a nodule incidentally on their scan, give them a written report, a letter goes out to patient and their non lahey primary care to at least try to launch the loops the patient and provider are aware that a nodule is uh, incidentally picked up in an ED setting um, to help move their, them along, even if they're outside of the Leahy system. Next slide. I think the key here, this is a slide just to remember, we need to move on reliably to software that allows us to uh, enhance our detection rate among radiology for scans that have nodules in them, report them in a standardized fashion outside of lung screening when that happens, and then track them in a systematic way using software that communicates agnostically with any of our EMRs and helps really populate these red flags of patients who have been no-shows or missed appointments. Next slide. It just, this is just VA data that shows when we do that, when we track things and we navigate with the process of a net human and automated uh, factors, we markedly reduce loss to follow-up and we reduce the, the time frame in which patients have a recognized nodule and get to the punchline when it comes to evaluation. Next slide. Um, this is, these are just slides. I'm going to click through these next couple of slides, Nicole, because they're just informational about the incidence of lung nodules in the interest of time. Next slide. Keep rolling. Next slide. Next slide. So this is so actually, if we can go back, I want to see the inclusion criteria. That right there. So this is the uh, CRICO safety net we've built for the incidental lung nodule. We created criteria in which we capture these patients in the safety net and when can we release them from the safety net. And this is agreed upon system wide and we're in the process of implementing this among multiple institutions. Next slide. I think this is where, when we think about stratification, I think it's really important to acknowledge the Brock calculator performs really well in the lung screening population and the incidental nodule. Um, again, think about the patient who's had a tobacco history, the radiographic characteristics with the Mayo calculator and um, other cal Brock calculator for can be used. Um, there's other, the Mayo calculator is often more commonly used uh, among validated nodule calculators and for determining risk. And this is where we start talking about the integration of a biomarker path path pathway or panel. Next slide. This is what, I, again, the VA model. Actually, that's perfect. We can go right into that, Nicole. Next slide. So this is, again, you know, I think the thing that's a head scratcher for all of us, I mean, we're good as clinical providers knowing who's high risk and for the most part knowing who's low risk. We sometimes outperform the calculators, and I think we have to remember that. But we all know that do we lose sleep a little bit about that inter intermediate risk nodule patient. And the patients may lose sleep. Some do, some don't. But the bottom line, how can we do better beyond just the size of the nodule, the radiographic features, popping in a calculator? How can we uh, either move to biopsy appropriately so faster, or when can we sit tight and watch and wait with surveillance? And this is where I want to give you a context in which you might consider using the biodesics, biomarkers, and other things that are coming around the pipeline, but just to give you a context for that. Next slide. So this is actually a clinic patient of mine, patient who came in. He actually had the CAT scan in the ER. Uh, he became a patient of mine, I should say. I didn't have him as a patient until he came through the nodule clinic, but he had this CAT scan for chest pain in the ER. You can see a right up below kind of irregular nodule. Um, it's kind of hard to put a handle on it. It's not perfectly round, but it certainly fell into the indeterminate or intermediate risk in a patient. Uh, he had no prior history of cancer. His 
pack year history is about 14, 15 pack years. So this might be the patient you might consider, can I up my ante and refine his stratification uh, beyond what we currently have? So, um, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through the generalities of um, by the biodestic CDT and the XL2 and, and kind of give you a context for when you might consider that. Next slide. So I'm gonna focus on the, the part on the left of the screen, the notified lung. You go, you go in with your risk assessment. I'll tell you which patients you might wanna th consider thinking about utilizing this test to help you with decision-making. And then how do you use the CDT? When do you use the XL2? Um, next slide. So I've already kind of alluded to the, we don't wanna take people to biopsy if they have benign lesions or surgery, more, more importantly. Next slide. So here, here are the basic fundamentals you have to have. You need to have a nodule that's eight to 30 millimeters in size. They have to be of a certain age, at least break 40 years of age. They can't have had, they can't have had a non-lung cancer less than five years from the time you're thinking about testing. And they really do fall based on using a male calculator, for example, in the 65% or less. And for the XL2, certainly 50% or less. Next slide. So again, think of the CDT as more of a rule in, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. Think of the XL2. It can be used in tandem with the CDT, but think of the XL2 as a ruling out. Shifting to benign is the XL2 potentially, shifting to higher likelihood of malignancy for the CDT if it's positive or if it's elevated in terms of percentages. Next slide. Uh, just keep clicking through that if you would, Nicole, to kind of manifest the whole slide. Thank you. So again, if you do a, a pretest probability and they fall in the indeterminate range and you do a CDT and it's positive, now it doesn't mean invariably that they have cancer, but it certainly pushes uh, the significance of doing something more actionable and, when, and you have a conversation with the patient and making it clear that it doesn't guarantee with complete certainty, but the, the predictive value uh, for this is, is high. Um, and I, we'll certainly answer questions during the after the, the presentation in the chat as well. Next slide. I think this should still, there we go, thank you. So I think this is an important slide to really kind of talk about what these tests really are. The CDT is blood-based autoantibody comprised of seven of the autoantibodies that are present when you have a likely malignancy circulating. Very specific, pretty high positive predictive value. Secondly, the Notify XL2, it's blood-based protein assay. It's a ratio of two proteins, which I'll dig, dig deeper in just a moment, has a very high sensitivity and a very high negative predictive value. Again, CDT, think rule in for a malignancy. XL2, think ruling out. Next slide. This is just a little bit drilled down about the different autoantibodies that are being tested for in that, in that text, in that test. Next slide. And then when you think about uh, the panoptic, this is where this, these were high prevalence population for lung cancer when they were testing the CDT and identified that it performed in this high, higher prevalence group of lung cancer uh, prevalence um, with the CDT in terms of a ruling in test. And next slide. This again kind of gives you the breakdown of how the CDT, you know, you're using that in the clinical context of your pretest probability, as well as what, when you fit into a true indeterminate classification of nodules. Next slide. And then this is just an example again, as the things that I mentioned, you may have had a pretest probability that was indeterminate, but the CDT kind of ratcheted up to a threshold where it puts you in a higher risk category where you'd have more of a conversation to think about taking a biopsy or do something more actionable beyond surveillance. Next slide. Just a few more slides to go to wrap up. This is the XL2 blood-based test. Again, it's gonna be a ratio of two proteins and it shows that the LG3BP actually has been noted to be significantly elevated in patients who have malignancy where the protein C1, uh, C1 C163A is found in macrophages and more associated with inflammatory changes, not malignancy. Next slide. And this is kind of the breakdown describing those different factors in the XL2. 
Next slide. And again, another uh, test with two-year follow-up in panoptic, how did it perform in terms of truly being um, truly benign? And it looks uh, here, as you can see alluded to in the slide, that the patients remained likely benign, one-year follow-up, and then two-year follow-up. So again, performed well as a rule-out test. Not perfect, but performed quite well when you're trying to stratify. Next slide. And again, this is just highlighting on what the base, the, the distribution often is for the XL2 results used in your clinical context. Next slide. And then again, if it comes back benign and lowers your threshold of risk for malignancy, it can often be very significantly important to help patients allay their fears, make patients feel more comfortable to, to be followed. And I think it's really helpful in having that patient conversation. I think it has, probably has the most meaning in those clinical conversations with patients. Next slide. And with that, that's, that's a whirlwind tour of lung screening, incidental lung nodule, our current workflow, and how biodesics and the different tests may be uh, helpful in utilizing stratification tools and in the indeterminate nodule. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carla. Um, uh, it's actually your talk actually helps me with my talk a lot because because the, the the running through the incidental nodule program, developing incidental nodule program, um, uh, really captures what you already spoke about in terms of how to identify the patients, get the patients through the workup pathway, and then ultimately getting them to the diagnose uh, through the th uh, therapy. So, um, uh, next slide, please. Again, um, my name is George Cheng. I'd like to thank everyone for coming in tonight. Um, uh, these are my disclosures, and I have to uh, disclose, I forgot to add that about D6 is on there as well. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, uh, tonight, um, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about the clinical problem, how to identify, how to implement in, uh, incidental lung nodule program and the lung nodule uh, problem as a whole, uh, how to uh, um, generate a nodule management program that is sustainable, how we integrate BioD6 into our, um, uh, our workflow uh, and uh, illustrate this through a case study. Next slide, please. Now, a uh, very smart person told me to thank uh, uh, the people who I work with uh, in the beginning of the slide, because you never know whether you're going to run over. Uh, so uh, this is my, um, uh, my group, uh, and I really uh, have to uh, acknowledge them. Uh, um, every day, they bring such joy to uh, the work, and the energy that they bring is infectious. So I'm extremely excited to, uh, uh, to come to work. Um, and also, um, uh, also, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, about D6 and my co-speakers uh, uh, co today, uh, Dr. Hogarth and Dr. Lam, uh, who, uh, uh, who have also influenced my, me through my uh, career development. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to thank them to share the stage tonight with me. Um, so uh, next slide. So part of the things that I wanna introduce everyone is what UCSD uh, campus is like. For those of you who don't know, um, UCSD covers both the Hillcrest campus, the VA uh, population, the VA San Diego Medical Center, and also the La Jolla campus, which is a spaceship um, uh, building that's on the upper, uh, upper left. Um, we also have the region's only National Cancer Institute, the, uh, which is the Morris Cancer Center. Uh, and together we, um, uh, with these four campuses, we see a variety of different patient populations. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so that's fine, keep on going. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, <laughs> so um, the state of lung cancer, as the, Dr. Lam have already uh, uh, shown that um, there is a uh, there is a problem with our current lung cancer screening, uh, and I've already highlighted this uh, for my own state here in California, uh, that we are actually ranked the bottom of the bottom. Our lung cancer screening percentage is only one percent. But if you look at globally in terms of cancer, lung cancer stats, there's a new diagnosis that's happening every two point five minutes. There's two hundred thirty seven thousand new diagnoses, and over forty four percent are caught at a late stage. And nationally, we haven't gotten any better comparing from 2019 to now. 
Uh, in fact, some will argue the pandemic probably had a negative impact on the lung cancer screening process. So uh, we have, we're behind, very behind. So only about 5.8% of those high risk are screened. So now you know which state is worst. Now we recognize the problem. We have a problem in California. Next slide. So with lung cancer, um, uh, with a patient with lung nodule and uh, they, uh, or any patient with lung, can lung biopsy candidates, they, they often face a suboptimal pathway for screening to diagnosis to treatment. Um, and uh, you know, prior to confirming diagnosis with this um, uh, recent publication, uh, the authors noted that uh, of a large cohort of patients, uh, they on average undergo 1.7 biopsies before they can reach a diagnosis. Next slide. And often, this is a typical care pathway that our patient goes through. You either go through an incidental finding or CT scan for lung cancer screening, go to your general practitioner, who then subsequently refer them to either oncology or pulmonology, who then refer farther to your local experts in terms of biopsy, either interventional radiologists or interventional pulmonologists, who then may refer to each other because they had a negative biopsy, and ultimately, a uh, patient undergo one or two biopsies uh, and get, before getting a diagnosis. Quite convoluted, if you may say, if I may say so. Next slide. Now, if you look at this, look at the, our, our, our patient population who we serve, 46% of our patients often require more than one biopsy. And this is again, large data. And this adds about 90 days to the patient treatment pathway, meaning from the diagnosis to actually delivery of therapy. Um, and next slide. And this comes, more than comes with more than just the cost of delay of care, um, because 13% of the cost of biopsy is related to the biopsy complications. And if you look at how, what's the cost of the patient to the patient who undergoes various procedures to get the biopsy, whether that may be a TTNA, a transbronchial biopsy, a navigation bronchoscopy, or a surgical biopsy, um, you'll see that with each additional procedure, the cost goes up. And this is before we get to therapeutics. Next slide. So uh, as mentioned earlier, the current detected detection of number of lung nodule via screening is about 40, uh, 420,000. Incidental nodule this past year is around 1.5 million. Uh, now, if you were to then, we also know that if we're screening only about 5.8% of the population, then what happens if we were to screen 100% of the population that's eligible? Um, uh, next slide. So if we were to detect it's 100%, if you just do the math, we're looking at 7.2 million nodules annually in the United States alone. And I think we're gonna be a, quite astonished because that is quite a lot of nodules out there for us as providers to kind of figure out which one to triage, which one should we go to biopsy, which one we should not biopsy and just a monitor. Next slide. Now, this is this busy slide or this kind of flow diagram illustrate the complexity of the UCSD lung nodule workflow. Uh, and I'm gonna go through the rest of my talk just focusing on this, uh, this uh, diagram. Uh, that was a joke. No, I, obviously I'm not gonna do that. Um, suffice to say that it is important to note that each program is very important, is very much tailored to your own local regional population referral pattern and your own local expertise uh, and the available resources that you have. Uh, in your local hospitals. Um, but what you can tell us is this. Next slide. Yeah, you're right. Next slide, please. We are trying to capture detection, which is often done through our radiology group uh, with, by collaboration with the radiology group using uh, either natural language processing or a specific flagging mechanism or a potential even radiomics to detect the incidental no lung nodule or nodule of interest in the local, in uh, UCSD is eight millimeter or greater. And once we got the detection, we like to guide the patient through the diagnosis pathway to figure out whether which one of these patients are better served by just doing appropriately watchful waiting and monitoring, which one of these patients we should go directly to biopsy or which one we should go to directly to surgery. 
and then ultimately leading these patients to therapy. Now, one of the major thing is time frame. Next slide. The time frame is ideally less than six weeks. So, um, uh, because anything longer than that have a negative impact to the patient's survival, overall survival in the future. Next slide. So what are our challenges as healthcare providers looking at globally as a nation, as a population health problem, we're dealing with the scale of the problem. As we're increasing lung cancer screening, we're gonna have more nodules detected. As we are increasing lung nodule screening and incidental nodule screening program being implemented, we need to actually pay attention to the patient selection, guarantee the speed at which we deliver the care, and also maintain a national standard of how we deliver these cares to our patient. Next slide. So you already seen this slide before. Um, and again, it's important to note that a lot of our challenges happen in that low to moderate risk. Is that big question mark. What happens to these patients with these intermediate risks? Do we do biopsy? Do we watch for waiting? Next slide. And also, Keeping in mind, it's important to note that on average, uh, national data, looking at um, 2015 from CHESS, 35% of surgeries are actually performed on benign nodules. And I wanna take a moment to think about this. One in every three thoracic surgeries that we, that our patients, our family go through could be potentially benign, one in three that could be potentially avoided. I wanted you to think about that a little bit. And also think about 62% of biopsies are performed on benign lung nodules. Now, often we also wanna think about that the biopsy themselves, remember, do carry with them. The biopsy themselves could, uh, could uh, carry with them complications, which contribute to about 13% of the cost. Next slide. So let's take this case I just saw in clinic about a month ago. This patient is a 72 year old female who is a never smoker. She had a history of multiple breast nodules that were briefly evaluated as fibroabnoma. She comes to me from an outside, uh, outside uh, hospital for, um, for a second opinion. Uh, and during one of these MRI, periodic MRIs that she is obtaining for her fibroabnoma, it was noted that she had an incidental lung nodule in the right upper lobe. And when we did the Mayo calculation, it's about 49% in terms of pretest probability. She falls right in that group of, of intermediate. Next slide. So here is the uh, scan of the patient. And that's the lung nodule that just went through uh, the scan. And you can see that it's about 2.5 centimeters um, and it is in the right upper lobe, right where the bronchovascular distribution is. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so 2.5 centimeters, upper lobe. She was a non-smoker with a history, with no his personal history of cancer, but she was 72 and lung, the lung nodule is not speculated. And when you're putting these calculate, when you're putting these criteria, it comes up with a 49% based on Mayo Clinic model. Uh, but we did decide after discussion with her that she wants to know if there's any other way for us to uh, help her to make a decision. So we said, let's send the XL2 study as you heard before, is a rule out study. And her rule out, her results came back to about 6%. And with this information, we said, well, let's wait a little while. Let's watch this and let's have a follow-up CT scan. Next, next um, slide. And here's the follow-up CT scan about six months later. If you can play the video, please. You can see that this lung nodule in the right upper lobe, it will come up soon, hopefully. Oh, it skipped. <laughs> we'll believe you that it got smaller, George. Yeah, it, was, mm -hmm. it got smaller to about two, uh, uh, about two point, uh, two point zero centimeters. So it uh, decreased by uh, uh, five millimeters, uh, 0.5 millimeters. Next, next slide. 
So, so because of that, um, is uh, we decide because of the um, because the bio D six um, test that we used in our workflow, and because of the discussion that I had with this patient, uh, individualized to this patient's preference. And the follow-up CT scan demonstrating that the nodule have reduced in size, um, we were able to avoid an unnecessary biopsy procedure, um, and um, the patient was extremely happy about uh, her um, uh, her results and and how we manage her lung nodule. So um, the take-home point here is that there's a lot of lung nodules out there, um, and especially locally where I practice, we see a lot of fungal uh, related disease that generate lung nodule. So having a test like this, uh, like BioD6, helps us to uh, stratify our patients, guide our management, and allow us to uh, take on the increasing volume of patients that need to go through our clinic. The pretest calculation models are limited, and using the notified studies can also help us to um, stratify our patients further. And just also keep in mind that benign biopsy procedure is not necessarily benign. Right. Um, so uh, in the future, we hope to integrate lung IQ and NGS testing in my practice. And I think uh, I'm going to hand this off to uh, Dr. Hogarth, who's going to tell us a little bit about that uh, in, in the next talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. All right. Um, so I, I'm going to echo briefly what George and Carla said in two two ways. I think the first most important thing to remember is because diagnostic yield is so important, relatively speaking, it is easier to diagnose cancer than it is to definitively prove benign. So when you use the notify test to eject all these benign cases that already are unnecessary biopsies, as a happy byproduct, you look already as a better bronchoscopist. But on top of that, word spreads rapidly that you are the thoughtful nodule program and your volumes go up. And I can share internal data with anyone who wants it to show you the growth of the University of Chicago program that's come for many different reasons, but on top of it has come from our use of this notify test as part of our evaluation with these patients to have a thoughtful discussion. It's become such an integral part that for us, it's part of our smart set that we order for all nodule workups, including, of course, infectious things, histo, blasto, you know, et cetera, coxie. And then we add this because we want this as part of our overall evaluation. The second thing about this test is, is, I think what my two colleagues also highlighted, this is not an absolute any more than your radiomics or your clinical experience is an absolute. There are no zeros and there are no 100s, right? Only Sith deal with absolutes. And so, sorry, I had to get my inner nerd in there. So the truth is you use this test as another piece of data to have that good discussion with the family about what is the best approach to manage your nodule. Nodules have become their own specialty. It's a specialty now, I think, arguably within pulmonary and even within interventional pulmonary. And so we need to arm ourselves with as much information as possible to have intelligent discussions. But what now I've been asked to do is to move past that. We've already found a nodule. We've already biopsied it. Or somebody presented with advanced stage, you know, the classic lung nodule slash lung mass, but also big bulky lymphadenopathy, bone meds, et cetera. We all know it's cancer, but we need to actually go prove it's cancer and then get the ball rolling on therapy. So that's me, Nicole, next slide, please. I don't, I didn't bother to put a disclosure slide because I don't have enough time to go through my disclosures. As those of you who know me, it'll take up um, the rest of the night. So uh, let's talk about IQ lung, next slide. So IQ lung is what we send as soon as we know you have a cancer. So the whole point about this, nope, one more, go ahead. Go ahead, next, go, there it is. So I love this, it's a silly quote from Dr. Uh, Pienta, but ask not just what the cancer is doing to you, what are you doing to the cancer? And, the, and the, the real purpose of that is, what is going on inside from the, the tumor itself? You know, what is it shedding? What can we pick up? But at the same time, what is the host doing? Because what can I learn? to help preserve tissue for future testing, to not waste it on unnecessary molecular testing when I can get that answer quicker from the blood. And the key here, if you take nothing away from tonight's talk, this part of it, realize that you can get answers about what to do about your patient's cancer rapidly. And in the competitive world that we all work in, and especially in bronchoscopy, where a lot of our money is built on downstream revenues, we have to keep you in the system. 
And if you go to my competing hospitals, because they can offer chemotherapies and targeted therapies and immunotherapies quicker, then the whole profit margin of bronchoscopy disappears. I need to keep you within my system, not let you go anywhere else. And I'm going to do that through rapid evaluation of the nature of your tumor and get you plugged in correctly. So next slide. This is important because this is the sad reality. Have you asked yourself why do drug companies uh, advertise chemotherapy on public television, like on regular channels? Seems stupid, right? I mean, there's, what's the probability that an oncologist is watching TV? They're not. They're trying to tag the patients. And the reason they're trying to tag the patients is that a significant amount of people begin first-line treatment for their cancer without having any understanding of what's going on molecular-wise and we all know the coolest thing that's been going on in lung cancer has been the better ability to treat these patients. So it's absolutely pathetic that our patients, your patient, right? You diagnosed them, that this patient's going on now and half the time doesn't even know the nature of their tumor. That, and then what does happen, of course, sometimes we don't have enough tissue. Now that, that's not always quote our fault. There are scenarios where there was um, an instable, an unstable patient. You, you've got just enough to make a diagnosis and anesthesia says, get out. So then you don't even have enough tissue and that does happen a lot. Of course, it also happens in scenarios where a needle biopsy by your radiologist gets done. And there's a lot of time wasted. Now, look, we can, we can fight and argue over what's the true risk of spread in the 26 days of a early stage cancer to a more late stage cancer. But honestly, the 26 days, you tell me I have cancer, I want therapy to begin yesterday. And I'm sure as hell not waiting 26 days for you to get off your butt to treat me. I'm gonna go doctor shopping rapidly. Next slide. And I'm not alone. This is actually the sad state of, of affairs across the United States and the US Oncology Network on prior to initiation of therapy, standard of care, uh, looking across mutations, not done very often. And so fine, I hate to say this, but our oncologists are dropping the ball. So this is my patient. And I am the person who found your lung cancer, diagnosed and staged your lung cancer. I'm going to be the guy that also then immediately and rapidly works up what molecular signals you have so that I can gift wrap you to my oncologist ready to rock and roll. Next slide. So that, go ahead, keep going. So that's where this comes in. This is the whole IQ lung testing suite. Next slide. Go ahead. Three days. So when we, right here, a pulmonologist, me, I do your bronc on a Thursday. I diagnose your late stage, whatever. Let's just make you a stage four adeno CA. We draw your blood right then and there. It gets shipped out that evening, overnight. So it arrives in Biodestis' labs by Friday. By Monday or Tuesday, I already know your results. You're not gonna see final path until Tuesday at our site. And by Wednesday, you're seeing oncology. And they already know what mutations. And if the oncologist decides to draw blood and send it through various NGS testing, that's going to take seven to 14 days. So that first visit's already pointless because you got to wait at least two weeks till you can begin therapy for the cancer that you already know. And when you get online as a patient, you already see that you don't have a lot of time. And then if they want some tissue-based one, good Lord, it might take another month. But why in the world would we not want to start right away? Next slide. Especially when the results that we get are, especially in that first three days, keep going, are for the actionable mutations, the ones that we can actually use. So right here, the Genistrat report, as you see, for the early stage and the end late stage picks up EGFR sensitizations, resistances, ALK, ROS, RET, KRAS, and BRAF. This is not looking for the 10,000 mutations, none of which you can do anything about. This is looking for things that your patient cares about now. Next slide. Does correlate very nicely to tissue. So this whole thing of like, can I believe the blood? Yes, you can. Next slide. When you want to get beyond that, the NGS sample, so when we do have a more advanced stage tumor where we might be running out of options, very useful to get classifications of evidence for results that tell you that we have 1A, this is a variant of strong clinical significance, and then level B evidence and level 2C and 2D, as you can read, getting back an analysis of uh, next-gen sequencing. Keep going. I'm going to give an example here because this is a perfect one. Just happened uh, recently. So a 72-year-old guy came into my practice he has a history of right upper lobe cancer, status post SBRT, he's a borderline candidate, whatever. He's got new right upper lobe and left upper lobe growing lesions. And the CT was done on June 6th. Now, because of his prior cancer only three years ago, um, he's not a candidate for notify. So didn't send notify. So June 6th, he gets a CT. Oh, sorry, June, not that. 
I guess I'm dyslexic. He gets it February 6th. February 6th, he gets a CT. On February 7th, his primary tells him, hey, you've got two new scary looking things. And he emails our group. So we see him on February 10th because our standard of care is to overbook anybody with a lung nodule. So he gets put into a clinic, wedged in somewhere. And he's taken to Bronx six days later for bilateral robot guided biopsies of both lesions and staging. And on rows, both are consistent with squamous cell carcinomas and the nodes are negative. So we maybe have two primaries or it's a recurrence or it's a spread from the one, you know, we're not sure yet. So Genistrat NGS and Veristrat are drawn. And I'll talk about Veristrat in a second, but the IQ lung is sent. And it's mailed out that day. And we draw it intra-op. So we're literally drawing it. You know, the guy doesn't even feel the blood draw. On Tuesday, the 21st, the results are delivered. The final path is consistent with both lesions, the same as his first primary. So this is a recurrence. He's advanced stage. On Wednesday, the 22nd, he sees Medonc NGS already in hand. And here's his report. Blanked out for patient safety. And there he is. He's got a MET mutation. And is actually keep going and even offers up a select clinical trial that he may be a candidate for, but equally important, um, uh, our medical oncologists already had some other thoughts as to what they were going to do uh, in regards to his MET mutation. So right up front, before he's even met the oncologist, they're already coming up with a way to try to help this guy. Next slide. We also sent Veristrat, which came back as Veristrat good. This is a proteomic assay. Next slide. We'll go through a little bit what that means so you understand, then I'll wrap it up for the sake of time. Keep going. What is it? So this is a measurement of a chronic inflammatory disease state. It's associated with an aggressive cancer. The Veristrat pores status is present in all stages of disease and all different performance statuses. And it becomes actually, sadly, a very pre a strong predictor of a bad outcome at least if you do what at the time is still considered standard of care. So Veristrat to us is extremely valuable to push our oncologists to try something different. And in certain patients, especially ones that are extremely comorbid conditions, it allows me, the pulmonologist, to have a frank discussion about, about outcomes and to talk to the family early on about palliative care, et cetera. These results, so like I said, are independent of ECOG, mutation status, pdl one treatment choice. And results come within 36 hours. Keep going. And it's measuring across several different acute phase reactants. Eight features observed with MALDI time of flight mass spectra from patient Sira. Keep going. And if you want to, if you want to learn a whole lot more, I, I guarantee you the med science people from Biodesis would love to nerd out with you. Give them a call; they will gladly um, uh, put you to sleep. I mean, make it really interesting. So um, here's the whole thing about better predictions of outcomes. Take a look here. When you look at the blues, these are the Veristrat goods across two different performance status versus the red and Veristrat poor. So even a uh, performance status of one, but a Veristrat good did better than a Veristrat poor at a zero performance status. Next slide. Same with here. Now, this is interesting. When you use it, immuno or um, ICI monotherapies, so PDL1 inhibition monotherapies, look at across you know, high PDL1, low, or negative. And in the group, when you had overall survival versus Veristrat poor, good versus poor. And this was on folks getting um, ICI monotherapy, so better predictor than any amount of, of PDL1 expression. Next slide. And when you tried to do this on immunotherapy plus chemotherapy, there, what you saw is maybe the Veristrat pores, they started, they didn't do as well as the goods, but it did highlight that maybe we have the chance to break this. What it does tell me is right up front, under no circumstances would a Veristrat pore, would I ever just give uh, immunotherapy because that outcome isn't going to matter. And I need to find something else to do for these patients. Next slide. <laughs> So the whole idea of this integrated testing about using and starting the ball rolling is that we want to get results quickly to save time, to save tissue, so that if there isn't a lot of tissue, you can preserve it for tissue-based genetic testing. If, the, if your oncologist do want to know about 5,000 different mutations, none of which are, are you know, anything you can do about, that's fine. The tissue is preserved for that. Get a better understanding of their inflammatory state and their actual mutations and get rolling and get rolling quickly and help guide them towards uh, clinical trials if that's very appropriate, depending on the patient's overall status. And they can go into it, but we've had, had not had an issue with reimbursement or anything like that. And we do this, like I said, right there at the time of the biopsy. So by the time final path is back, we already have actionable mutations. And then one final thing, like everybody else on this line, your oncologists probably have some very specific uh, tissue-based 
and or tests that they like from company whatever and you know biotech success competitors so here's the best part this iq lung we send this precisely because my medical oncologists have asked us to send it because they want these results now and then if they're going to send something else the insurance still covers it they cover one test per company per patient so if you're an oncologist i'm going to see nicole nod your head if i'm correct yep see that if they want to send four other genetic tests through the blood or the tissue knock yourself out waste the patient's money go right ahead but it doesn't in any way shape or form they will it will be covered your patient will just have whatever their copay is so we're not harming any part of the pathway of care we're actually informing it making it move quicker and arriving a happier patient to the oncologist office and with that i believe i had my last slide yep i always end with this maybe next year but this was the single greatest year of my life when i was the team physician for the hawks there's my cell phone there's my email if I can help um, uh, ever, uh, please reach out. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll mute my line. Awesome. Thank you all so much um, for such an engaged uh, presentation, conversation, and talking about the entire continuum of care from you know, these screen nodules to what's being found incidentally, and hopefully how biodesics can continue to help your, your lung cancer patients get diagnosed as quick as possible and their time to treatment.